Hello, I'm Gavin Clark, and I'm here talking to Werner Solstro. He is the creator of the C++ programming language. Werner is also a technical fellow and managing director in the technology division at the Stanley in New York. And he's also a visiting professor in computer science at Columbia University. Hi, Werner. Hi. Uh, it's 35 years uh, since uh, C++ was, uh, was created by Werner. Um, it's become a very popular programming language. It's used widely in a number of scenarios, web browsers, operating system kernels, Google search engine, is the driver to video games. Uh, it's still uh, 35 years on, which is a remarkable achievement for any programming language. It's in one of the top five still of languages that developers choose to build their software in. And it runs at the National Museum of Computing at Fletchley Park. Some of the 50,000 computers uh, artifacts there, which include personal computers and other systems, also use C++. You won't be surprised to learn. But let's go back to those early days. We can talk the technology. We will talk the technology. Diana, you were at Bell Labs. It's, it's, it's 1985, when the, uh, which is, it was officially released, but you were working on the language before that. Um, ha briefly, how and why? Did you start working? Why did you build a programming language? Why, what frustrated you with the way things work? Why did what did you try to set out to achieve? I, I arrived at Bell Labs uh, to work in a com uh, computer research center um, in '79, and I wanted to do work on distributed computing, uh, partly based on my work at the University of Cambridge, where I got my PhD, and. Um, I tried a few things and then I realized I, one of the reasons I couldn't make major progress was that there was no language that allowed me to express uh, what I felt needed expressing uh, to build a distributed system. That's a system that uses multiple processors, multiple computers connected through either shared memory or, um, or, or wires. And um, I needed two things. I needed a low level programming language that could uh, really use hardware very, very well, use every byte, every cycle. And those are quite a few languages that could do that, notably C, which was developed by um, Dennis Ritchie, yeah. whose office was down the corridor from me and uh, across the uh, corridor. And uh, so that's an obvious thing to use. And then I needed a high level thing, something that could uh, express things that there's a part of a system here and there's a part of a system there. They're separate, they communicate uh, in these particular ways with these particular protocols. And so I needed a high level and a low level language. And there was lots of high level languages, lots of low level languages, but none that could do both. And um, I, I used Dennis's language C for the low level bit, and I knew Simula, which is the first object oriented programming language. Uh, I've been taught that by Christ Nugor, who invented it and invented object oriented programming. Uh, he was a visiting professor in Aarhus, where uh, I did my master's. And then I took the class concepts, the ability to define new types uh, from Simula added it to C and that's where C++ came from. Right. So it's very much to solve a specific, were you building something specific in mind or is it more kind of a, a broad area, research area you were looking at? Oh, no, no, no. I wasn't trying to build a language. I just needed a tool. Right. And uh, to build my distributed system, I needed something to write the low level and high level code. And then I was going to get some computers and hook them together and program this stuff. And we might have gotten the first Unix cluster out of that if I had um, gotten there. But once I built the language, my friends and colleagues were founding, finding it useful. It was actually a very useful tool. This idea of being able to do high level stuff and low level stuff, the ability to do high level stuff efficiently uh, were rare, um, probably non-existent in those days. And so people started using my language and I started having to support them, help them, help them get started, fix bugs, improve the compiler, things like that. So I never got to build my system. <laughs> uh, we ended up with C++ instead. 
And uh, well, so from, from being a personal project for me to build a tool for a specific thing, we now have a community of maybe four and a half million uh, developers uh, using it today. And I'm still busy trying to keep this thing uh, useful and relevant and stable. And of course, it's, I think it's, it's a standard as well. You didn't set out to build the lang, a, a lang. But you, you did. It, 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 like, were you working on your? Uh, were you work? Were you burning the midnight oil on your own? Were you solo on this, or did you have support? I mean, you managed. You managed. For to many for many years, it was a solo project. For the, pro, uh, for the first two or three years, it was just me, and then for another couple of years, I had some help. But when we released the first commercial release, I'd written 98% of the code and most of the documentation and almost all of the tutorial material. And then slowly over the second part of the 80s, um, I sort of faded out of the uh, compiler building and mixing and stuff and more into the design and uh, documentation and popularization of the language. What, I mean, what was that like working on your own? I mean, you're at Bell Labs, uh, that, that organization dates back to 1925, it's famous for innovation, it created the transistor. This is another great idea comes out of it, but you were working on your own. What was it? Is it something in the air at Bell Labs? Did you have the support you needed? How did you manage to do that on your own? There's uh, something in the air there. And no, I didn't do it on my own in that sense. A lot of C++ was uh, designed on other people's blackboards. Uh, so when you get stuck, you go and talk to somebody. There's lots of brilliant people around and quite a few of them were really nice people. And uh, it was one of the few places I've been to where you can walk into most people, ask them a question or ask them to listen to an idea and get some feedback. Mm -hmm. And like Brian Kernighan and uh, Doug McElroy, uh, L.A. Hope, they're famous for other things, uh, and they had the patience with the young guy that had some screwy ideas and uh, sort of helped straighten out the ideas a bit, uh, helped me give feedback, tell me where I was wrong, uh, encouraged me where I was right. So, um, yes, it was a one person project, but it was a one person project in a very supportive uh, community and with some really brilliant people that was also nice. At what point did you kind of realize that this was big or had huge potential? Did it cross over from solving particular issues to this has bigger applicability? Did, what point did the light bulb go off? It took some time. I was a bit slow on this. Uh, somewhere along the first year, I realized I was doing a programming language. I hadn't even figured that one out in the beginning. I was just building a tool that needed some... Um, some, some, some language technology to, to get it done. I used, before that, uh, I used to work with machine architectures, so I knew my hardware very well, but I've decided that Intel was going to win all the hardware wars, so clever hardware was not going to work. So I had to work more with language and compilers. But I was working with compiler technology uh, to make construct, to make this tool uh, for, half a year or a whole year before I realized I was doing language. And um, fortunately, I had a good background in compilers and languages. I knew several dozen languages at the time. Uh, so I had back technical background, in the academic grounding and that kind of stuff. So it wasn't flying blind. And then I got very busy. I mean, my 80s is sort of a blur because of all of the stuff uh, that was being done. But somewhere in the 80s, I realized that this, this, this actually wasn't just my little language. It was something of, of uh, significance. What is it about C++ that has enabled it to create and made it so popular and viable for so many developers so many years on in a world that's changed massively from 1985 yeah. or even 79 when you, you joined yeah, Bell Labs? It yeah, it's, um, it's the fact that it's good at hardware. It's good for manipulating hardware. Hardware is weirder than it ever was. Uh, for people who want this pipelines, this speculation, there's uh, all kinds of clever stuff in, in the hardware. And to, to use that well, you need a, need a language with a good machine model and a good way of manipulating it. And I borrowed the machine 
Dean model from Dennis Ritchie from C, <coughs> and it's the strength of C and C++. But then you need to do more than hardware. You need to abstract from it and create something that's fit for humans. Yeah. Humans don't think in terms of bits and bytes and uh, uh, cache lines. They, they think in terms of, say, matrices, if you're an engineer or, um, or, a, or a mathematician. You, know, you think about uh, electric motors, if you are into planes or cars. Um, you, th you think about uh, uh, learning engines, if you're into artificial intelligence. Um, so uh, those things need the abstraction bits that initially came from um, from from Simula. And I was talking to somebody doing uh, data research at Berkeley uh, some time ago, and they said, you know, uh, one of them said, you know, I spent nine eighty. I spent 98% of my time writing Python and my processor spent 98.5% of its time running the C++ generated from the Python. Um, so uh, it's, it's there, usually underneath what you're doing, usually where you don't see it. I mean, you look into a camera and somebody's taking a snapshot, you don't think software, uh, but it's there. And I suppose the other question is, are you, you know, Surprise me. Are you pleased? Are you pleased or surprised with the, where, the way it's worked out with the level of uptake? That's, that's good. Yes, I'm very surprised and very pleased. It's yeah. really nice to have done something useful. Also, sometimes I'm a little bit scared because there's a responsibility that comes with, with doing something important that people rely on. Um, if the C++ standards committee screws up, it harms people. And I must try and do my best to make sure we don't screw up. And when it goes back to when it was me doing, doing most of the things, I was a little bit scared, but I was too busy to be seriously scared. I was too busy solving problems. You're reportedly famous for saying, quite Marks, C, C makes it easy to shoot yourself in the foot. C++ makes it harder, but when you shoot yourself in the foot, with C++, you typically blow your whole leg off. Did you really say that? Is that just uh, uh, an internet? Thing? Yes. No, no, no. That's, uh, that's correct. I was uh, up in Boston, actually, giving a talk somewhere in the, um, in the 80s, and somebody asked me a question, and that was part of the answer. Um, one thing people don't realize is that in any language with any power, you can make mistakes. And the more powerful the language is, the bigger mistakes you can make. And what matters is not whether you make mistakes or not, because you do, it's whether you find those mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I was actually quite happy about this blowing off the leg thing, because you notice it. And then you can fix it. And people don't usually get that second part of my thought. Mm -hmm. Somebody who at Bell Labs once explained uh, the difference between C++ and C, as C was a saw and C++ is a power saw. If you use it wrongly, if you take a, a saw and do this, well, nothing much happens if you hit a hard piece of wood. If you take a power saw and you don't know how to use it, you use this with a power saw. If it jumps, it'll take your leg off. That was not my idea. It was not my version of the story. But uh, basically, if you use a power tool, you have to be more careful. You have to know how to use it. Yeah. Would you, uh, if you had to do C++ again, any changes you make to it, or would you leave it as is? I think the major parts are right in the sense that the major parts should be there. And I don't think there's any detail I couldn't do better in hindsight. But you don't get that chance. Because once it's deployed, people want stability. They always want two things. They want stability. Don't break my code. Whatever you do, don't break my code. And they want new things to make things simpler, easier, faster, uh, more fashionable sometimes. But I don't care so much about fashion. And, um, well, I don't know how much C++ is out there, are out there, but it's hundreds of billions of lines of code. You just don't go and break that. That'll be irresponsible. As I said, 
do something important, there's a certain responsibility that comes with it. And not breaking your code is sort of part of mine. Happy with it? No, no, the fundamentals there you wouldn't make any changes if you have to do it again. A few minor changes, but uh, it's if you take any part, any of the big words you have there, uh, modules, templates, concepts, exceptions, classes, they would, they would be there. Yeah. But details could be improved. I mean, you do learn something. You learn something every year. And I've been working on this for 40, so I've learned quite a few things. Mm. It's just, well, you don't get two, two chances very often in this game. Mm. Once it's out there, it's real. You can't just go and break it. Well, that's, I think that's about all we've got time for, Diana. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here chatting to us today. Thanks very much for taking the time. And thanks for, for inviting me. Uh, the museum is, is important. The history of our field is important. It's, uh, people know too little about the background, the history of our field. And, uh, you help uh, enlighten people about that. Thank you.